Good morning. My name is Michael Masters, and I serve as the president of the Soufan Center. On behalf of our founder and the team at the Soufan Center, as well as our partners at Georgetown University, Qatar, Qatar University, and the Qatar International Academy for Security Studies, we are honored to welcome you to day two of the Forum on Returning Foreign Fighters. I'd like to recognize and thank all of our speakers, moderators, and panelists from yesterday. We were particularly honored to have His Excellency Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdulrahman Al Thani provide our keynote address. We look forward to a continuation of the engaging, insightful, and thought-provoking discussion on this critical topic. Before I introduce our next moderator, I'd like to provide a brief overview of the day. We will begin with two one-on-one -on -one discussions. The first featuring His Excellency Dr. Khalid bin Mohammed Al Atiyah, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of State for Defense Affairs. Our second featured guest will be His Excellency Panos Kamenos, Minister of National Defense, Greece. We'll then have a coffee break, followed by our first panel and lunch. I would now like to introduce the host of our first one-on-one -on -one discussion, Steve Clemens. Steve Clemens is editor-at-large of The Atlantic and editor-in-chief of Atlantic Live, the events division of The Atlantic. He also founded the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation, a centrist policy think tank in Washington, D.C., where he previously served as executive vice president. Steve writes and speaks frequently on national security, politics, and economic policy issues. During the moderated discussion, for those that wish to submit questions, they may do so at questions at foreignfightersandreturnees.com. I'd also like to mention, for those of you that tweet, the Prime Minister's Twitter account is at KBM Al Atiyah. And I'm sure that you can tweet at him, and he will be pleased to tweet back at you or retweet. Thank you all very much. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce Steve. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Dr. al it's so good to, to see you. Let me um, uh, just start this morning uh, by sharing a little bit of your introduction, because many of, you, many of us know you as the Deputy Prime Minister of Qatar, uh, the Minister of Defense of Qatar, but I want to remind people that you were a pilot, you were a lawyer, you were President of the National Committee on Human Rights, you have a diverse portfolio, and I'm going to start with the first major question, uh, you went to King Faisal Air Academy in Riyadh, the Beirut Arab University in Lebanon, and the Cairo University in Egypt. Which country did you like best? Yeah. <laughs> Qatar. <laughs> I like to be the uh, pilot one. It's, uh, it's the most closest one to my life. But, uh, you know, I, uh, I get education from all those countries. I have good memories on that uh, days whether it was in uh, Saudi or Egypt and Beirut, UK or the United States. Uh. Well, I raise it because the diversity of your experience, you know, lawyer, human rights, now working in the defense and, and midfield, we're discussing foreign fighters here, how to uh, look broadly at the challenges here in this country, but in the region, uh, in thinking about, you know, rehabilitation, reintegration, uh, and that dimension. And so I'm intrigued in where the connection may be between the diversity of your own background and how you look at the foreign fighter experience you've had in Qatar and that you're facing now. Yeah, I know that uh, we have short time, so I will just uh, share with you the experience that Qatar, uh, uh, you know, been through. I think Qatar have a unique uh, approach to the foreign fighter. And I might give an example on the retainee from Afghanistan on the 80s. So many of our uh, uh, young uh, uh, men have uh, left to Afghanistan from the region. And Qatar is one of the, the country which uh, we had some of our uh, uh, you know, men went there uh, to, uh, to Afghanistan. But uh, I remember when the, uh, when the war is over, His Highness the Emir at that time decided that we should not let go of this, uh, you know, they are Qatari citizens, mm -hmm. and uh, we should uh, uh, look uh, after them 
rehabilitate them, and then uh, bring them back to society. And if you compare what we did since then, you will find out that most of the people who was Hanis the Amir decided to bring them back, rehabilitate them and give them a decent education, and then later on decent job, uh, most of them now are doctors, engineers, and they live their life uh, uh, normally. Where if you see the, uh, the other uh, mm -hmm. country, which decided that they have used their people, and it is the time to abuse them now. Sorry if I, I use the term use and abuse, but this is exactly what happened. So they tried to push them away, and they squeezed them. So we find them popping out in Chechnya, then we saw them in Bosnia, then we saw them in some mountain in North Africa, and then they have spread. Which countries are the head of the use and abuse practice? Well, so many in the countries have, uh, have did, not, did not take care about their people. The Saudis, for example, Egypt, uh, so many countries. There is nothing we can hide today. Everything is, is, uh, you know, is known to everybody. But here where we started to uh, face the problem. You do not encourage your people to do things to you when you have an interest. Mm. And when your interests flip, you flip your people. I understand countries flip their each other when it comes to interest, but I never understand that countries flip their people when their interests change. So this is a small example uh, of how we took care of the uh, you know retainee at that time. You know, I know that you have very specific ways that you think about rehabilitation, reintegration of foreign fighters. What do you think it takes to get it right? We're struggling in this conference. It occurs to me in the panel that, that comes after the defense minister uh, with Karen Greenberg uh, moderating, we'll be discussing accountability, accountability for actions. And others are looking at uh, how do you bring people in and essentially give them a second or a third chance to integrate. How do you get that equation right specifically? Well, for sure there have to be an, a, a legal platform on this. You have to have the laws in place and, and so on. But then uh, uh, you will deal, uh, it's a burden, but uh, it is the, 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 the country responsibility. You should look at each individual case. Uh, uh, you know, case by case, and try to treat them. So, so we 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 look after the. Uh, we started with laws, and then, as I said, we started to uh, rehabilitate them, and then we start to uh, give them the education, proper education they need, and then the proper job. And when they fail, well, then you go to the law. You go and implement the law because if you have done everything in your power to contain them and then someone decided to keep uh, doing what they are doing, then you have already prepared the platform, which is the, the legal system. Peter Bergen yesterday made a comment on Afghanistan that I found uh, scarily prescient of what might happen if the Afghan elections don't go well. Uh, that you could find a situation in which a low-level civil war becomes very hot again and then draws back many of the fighters that have been fighting in Syria or in Iraq and other places. Um, and I'm interested in, you know, given the fact that you have played a role throughout, in Afghanistan throughout the region uh, in mediating so many of the conflicts, and you're doing so now, uh, in fact, uh, with, with our envoy from the United States, uh, with the Taliban, how do you look at Bergen's comment about the dangers of the Afghan election next year? Well, Afghanistan is a uh, you know, very uh, important case. We are, by the way, in Afghanistan, we are a facilitator, more of a right. facilitator than a mediator on this case. And I think there is, uh, uh, even though it is not on my portfolio, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I get uh, news from my colleagues who are running this fight, that there is some positive stop coming. So we would like to be optimistic because being uh, uh, otherwise in Afghanistan, it's not something pleasant we both would like to think about. The, 
many countries, and, 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 and many countries, one of the countries that you went to school in, accuse Qatar of hosting Muslim Brotherhood, of terrorists, of, 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 of being connected to that. And just being here the last few days, I see this country as uh, uh, one of fascinating contradictions where lots of different things happen here. I'd be interested in your response to those critics of Qatar when Qatar is saying it, that it is a, playing a mediating role with so many, and, and you look at that as a strength, what is the response to, to those that have been saying that you're, you're playing with fire with some of these groups and hosting them here? Well, we've been, uh, we faced the most severe attack ever by uh, any country by their members. And they started with this uh, fairy tale about uh, uh, terrorism and, and, uh, and financing terrorism just to delegitimize Qatar on the international arena. They tried their best. Mm. One thing I want to tell you, Steve, Qatar is a, uh, uh, you know, we have an, uh, we have uh, uh, um, uh, ambition, we have goals, we have vision, and we decided that no one can destruct our vision. This is why mm. uh, Qatar is a country where you can trust and you know that they can deliver for the good of the of the people and uh, today uh, after 15 or 16 months of bashing Qatar in every manner they can they used everything against us they use mosque they used the music they use actor they use uh, friends influential friends country and you name it and in the end of the day, the world find out that Qatar never chase or hunt or smoked out or whatever people who would like to express, uh, you know, uh, themselves or the freedom of speak. We never go and, and, and hunt those people. I think Qatar work uh, speaks to itself and our relation with other countries being at trusted member for a mediation or a facilitator to bring people together, I think this is a, a proof that speaks to itself. I, I, I don't want to give you know, so many examples, but some of them are Darfur, uh, you have Lebanon before, uh, you have Yemen before sure. this, uh, this uh, chaos. Today you have just mentioned uh, the Afghani, uh, you know, Taliban, the American, the Afghan, Afghanistan government. So many examples I can state to you. Friendship fund on Japan, friendship fund in Tunisia, uh, f uh, friendship fund in the States, uh, Carolina, 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 is it? And if I, I pronounce it right. So, some say Carolina, some say Carolina. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I think uh, Qatar proven that uh, we uh, do uh, good to the world, not otherwise. If Mohammed bin Nayef were still crown prince in Saudi Arabia, would your relationship with Saudi be in a different place? Well, I, I cannot uh, speak on the, uh, on the uh, you know, I cannot predict what will, will, will happen. But, uh, you know, uh, at some stages, uh, some stage, we have a decision maker where we can work with to uh, the uh, stability and the prosperity of the region. Maybe now with this crisis, I think it's one of the first of its kind. I believe myself this is one of the first on the globe that you have a dispute with someone and there is not there is no a single back channel door. During the world, the, the Cold War, uh, we see lawyers, we see ambassadors, we see intelligent uh, agents who go and engage and. But not on this one. This one has totally, uh, you know, uh, weird, if you may call, on the, on the political or geopolitical uh, arena. Let me ask you a question about hard power and military. I don't know if many of you have had a chance to visit the Millipol uh, Forum the over at the Convention Center. Um, the one uh, recommendation I would make to Qatar is to turn it into a movie set. There are so many cool things that could be used in awesome movies. Um, 
uh, over there and, uh, you know, a Glock taser or a uh, big, but the millipole form is fascinating. But when it, sometimes we talk about Qatar playing a mediating role, but what, I know you're buying 24 new jets, Typhoon jets, but how are you preparing and thinking about the military dimensions of your security, which I think much of it is reflected, at least on the interior side in, in, the, in the forum across the street, but, but as you look at the potential for hard security issues here in this country, what, is, what are the big challenges up at night issues you have? When you buy a new car, Steve, you always uh, buy your insurance policy with it. Mm. With Qatar magnitude in economy and in energy sector and the, uh, the welfare to, their, to the Qatari people, I think the defense today is an insurance policy. And what we are doing on the, uh, on the direction of His Highness the Emir uh, to strengthen uh, our defense capability it's not to be uh, aggressive or to be hostile against anyone, no. We would like to have our shield and sword, and this will bring stability and prosperity to the area because when you have a deterrent force, you are definite that you will not be attacked or you don't have to think to attack anyone because you believe in your strength. And, and this is, I think, our doctrine for the coming years in the military field. And do you think there are dimensions of this that fit into, we're having a session later this morning on technology uh, and technology and whether it serves as an aggravator of, of terrorism and conflict in the region or whether it helps you solve some of those challenges. So again, from a national security side, how do you apply technology, and that could you know, move into areas such as cyber and others. I don't know what's under your purview in the defense ministry, but, but increasingly old classic wars with machines are only a small piece of that. So how do you look at the evolving technology part of the terror question? No, in fact, it's very important to uh, tackle this issue because all the system you buy, you get today are uh, high tech, and this high tech needs and very advanced cybersecurity system. And we give a lot of our time, effort, uh, to build up our capability on cybersecurity. You know, we have big events coming down the road, and we need to be, to be prepared. Today, uh, they don't have, uh, you know, uh, excuse me, I come from a hardcore place with the Ministry of Defense. So the language, I will, the terminology will... Please use hardcore uh, language. No one will assassinate someone today by using the old-fashioned rival today. Uh -huh. They will wait to you until you get into your car, they lock the door, they drive you away, and they throw you in the seat. This is how technology and cyber security need to be, you know, uh, up to date to defend such... Uh, assassination approach, if we may call. Just to make it easy for Yeah, that's a very audience. interesting story. I'll have to, we'll have to chat more about that later. <laughs> um, again, to, to come back uh, for a moment to Zaddy, I, I, I asked another uh, Qatari government official to give me a question for you. Uh, and so I won't name uh, the person. Uh, but, but this person said, is the Saudi UAE threat over, or is it something that still concerns you that they might carry out military action? Today we don't see, uh, to be honest with you, our policy, at least on the Ministry of Defense, we don't see names. We see ourselves, we prepare ourselves. Today uh, we are uh, in a way that we are prepared uh, no matter the threat comes from which direction. Maybe we've been grown, when we are our children, we've grown for one single threat, and this is what we have been learned all the time. But today, no. Today, our uh, doctrine is to prepare ourselves and to be ready, no matter uh, uh, the threats come from which direction. So you don't see a threat, particularly from the UAE and Saudi Arabia? Well, I will prepare myself very well. We'll prepare our people to be ready. But uh, to be honest with you, we don't uh, think this way. Mm. Uh, what we do is we plan, we put our strategy, we plan, and we drive on. And this is the way we are doing. Let me give you more power um, than you already have, though you have considerable power, and put you in charge of the Yemen problem. How would you fix it? Well, uh, I'm sure Sheikh Tamim can fix it. <laughs> 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 
you need to have a, you need to create a platform. And uh, thank you. You need to create a platform, and you need to be a, a man who understand that if you need to bring uh, stability to a country, you need to allow everyone to sit on this table and talk. Every Yemeni have the right to sit on the table and share his concern, and then, only then, you will get to a solution that will save Yemen. But if you try to uh, pretend that you are the saver of the world, and in the same time, you have a deeply uh, deep interest of yours on X or Y country. I, I think it will prolong. We will see more of uh, the uh, ugly uh, scene which we are seeing in the TV. Children are dying from uh, from cholera. All these epidemics are spreading in in Yemen. Women being bombed, school, you name it. Yeah. Unless you have, uh, uh, you know, you have a heart to solve this and bring everybody to the table uh, to discuss their issue, I think it will prolong. So definitely you need Tamim. General, gen yeah, Tamim, uh, uh, yes, the Emir, but General, general Mattis, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Secretary Mattis, Secretary of State Mattis in the United States, and uh, Secretary of State Pompeo in the United States have called for a ceasefire uh, in Yemen. Do you think there's an opportunity there? And what well, role? Well, if, and, they, and, have, and, and, and if could, they have the will, there is a way. Yeah. And, and could, Qatar, could Qatar insert itself somehow in that equation in a way that it hasn't been? We will, right never, we will never go and imp, in, you know, uh, force ourselves or impose ourselves. But if a friend uh, uh, call for an, an help, or if somebody send us an uh, SOS signal, I think we are, uh, we are uh, willing to help whenever we can. At the end of the day, there is, a, you know, innocent people are being uh, dying every day. And this is not a very pleasant uh, uh, scene. You know, you and, I, you and I have had discussions in the past, and I know, I know you're a serious strategist. And, you know, the Atlantic, we journalists, you know, Charlie Savage and other people, Peter Bergen, we're storytellers. And in stories, you have heroes and you have villains and you have lots of people in between. And I'm interested in how you see who are the villains in the Yemen story as you see it from here. Well, uh, I would like, if it's okay for you to be a great article we can have in no, the no, no. Atlantic. Uh, rephrase, rephrase your question, please. But I am, I am sure. I use harsh language, you know, like villain. <laughs> Leave it. You to use me. assassination. I use villain. <laughs> Leave it to me. I just steep. <laughs> No, I think Yemen is a Yemen is a problem. Yemen is a problem for everyone, and it's been proven from century that no one tried to conquer Yemen and succeed it. It will only it takes you, you know, the, the, the sand will 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 suck whoever try to, uh, you know, conquer Yemen. So the best way to do it is what I told you. The table is the best place to solve the best place to solve uh, the Yemeni issue. No hard way right. to solve the Yemeni case. Uh, let's talk about Qatar's role in both, again, soft power, trust building, mediation, uh, and hard power, and the kind of, you know, we have the Greek defense minister here. Uh, uh, I asked him when we walked in what question he would ask, and he said to ask you about the role Qatar plays in Greek and Turkish relations. You helped uh, negotiate the release of, of Greek soldiers, but. I'd broaden it to talk to you about how you see yourself injected into many of these issues and challenges as a mediator, a facilitator, um, and, and you're doing that now with the Taliban and, and our envoy, uh, Zal Khalilzad. So how do, tell us what the theory of the game is here. Well, uh, I know for a fact that both countries have a good intention, Turkey and Greece, and I believe with the uh, friendship we have among each other, uh, we can uh, we can ease uh, so many things together, and I'm sure uh, the Qatari government will spare no effort uh, to bring this uh, you know point of view closer uh, to each other. And and as I told you, if there is something good we can do, we always stand ready to do so. Let's talk for a minute about the Taliban office. There's been a report that five Guantanamo detainees that are senior Taliban have joined the mission here 
and some are looking at that as, as, as a positive sign that maybe negotiations here in Doha may be getting in, in, a, in a place that they've never been before. Um, your thoughts? Yes, you know that the, the T5 are in Qatar uh, upon the request of the American government from, you know, uh, to start with. But again, I told you in the beginning of our discussion today that Qatar is a facilitator in this situation. And then uh, we will only facilitate what the both uh, party would like to, uh, to go on. So I cannot comment because I don't have a say on the way forward what they would like. The only thing I can tell you that if this is their intention, that to involve them or not, we will only have to facilitate this. To and do you think it's a good thing that these five have joined the office? Well, from my, from my own perspective and my humble experience in the past, it is not bad to have uh, someone who, who has an experience in the past and, and you feel that he is your enemy, is to sit at the end of the day, in the end of the day, only strong men who will bring peace to the table. I want to remind people that you can email your questions from your phone, uh, I believe, and I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, to questions at foreignfightersandreturnees.com. Someone holler, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So questions at foreignfightersandreturnees.com, and I'd be happy to ask you. Last night, we saw here in this room an incredible film uh, the most depressing film I have seen in years called Children of Mosul uh, or Children of Isis, Children of Mosul, maybe a, a, a little bit of both, but, but, but looking at Mosul and what had happened on both sides and, and uh, by Francesca Manocchi, uh, who's here with us today. And if there was an overriding theme of that film, it was the cycle of vengeance, uh, the wrongs done to others, the inability for uh, uh, a victim that saw their livelihood, saw their family members killed and murdered and butchered uh, to live next door to those that did that before. And then the reversal of fortune and how young children that uh, she managed to interview, really you felt that the motivating uh, North Star in their life was to kill those that had done this to them. I, I, I'm, I'm intrigued, it gave me nightmares. This is the world you're in. How do you undo that toxicity in relations when we talk about this foreign fighter challenge? Because it, it, it's not a neat, easy, what we would call kumbaya kind of thing. It, real people have died, real people want revenge. How do you sort that out? Well, uh, I am sorry to, to hear, you know, uh, that you have uh, seen such a film, but we've been seeing this uh, yeah. ugly scene for a long time, and we try to we try to shout out that it is not enough to chase the terrorists and kill them. Uh, okay, uh, this is one method, but the the other approach has to be to treat the cause from the root, and this is what we've been calling on that development giving people hope is the only way uh, to expedite solving such issues. And I'm not talking about country who originally have no natural resources which they can do this. I'm talking about countries at that such, such time they have a so bad management, they did not properly use their resources to rehabilitate their people or give them hope or development. Okay. Today I'm not here to give you theories, Steve, but what I'm trying to say is, uh, example like Iraq, uh, I think everybody here should uh, uh, put hands on hand to exp expedite helping the government of Iraq to rebuild uh, Iraq. The only time that these people will live side by side together in peace, if you develop, if you redevelop their places, uh, secure jobs for them, let them be busy on their life, day-to-day -day life. And I think this is the only solution I can see on the horizon now. Thank you. Let me ask you a question about the U.S. military base here, which is huge. Uh, CENTCOM uh, is based there. Uh, I've, I've been reading about your interactions with General Votel and, of course, Secretary Mattis. And it looks like a healthy relationship. Does the United States try and pressure you in your relationship with Iran? 
because of the leverage of that base? Never. Uh, and uh, I can see it here, uh, Claudi. Our relation with the United States is a strategic relation, uh, but it is built into a mutual respect, I, I can assure you. It has been like this so many uh, years ago. And, uh, so many of my colleagues here mm -hmm. have been in the government on the if so-called the bad days with the you know uh, the administration and the good days. And all this time, whether it's bad or good in terms of ideas uh, or, or opinion, uh, we have always respected each other as, as two countries. So they have never been uh, intimidating uh, us on any uh, way. They never, uh, you know, they never uh, put a precondition. And they respect our sovereign decision, and this is the most important thing. Uh, uh, you know, I can assure it. Assure how, you today. how do you keep the, the bases in Saudi Arabia years ago seem to be radicalizing for some? How do you keep the base in Qatar from becoming a radicalizing force with your own citizens? Simply, we don't have radicalized uh, people. People of Qatar are very humble and very friendly. All of them? Yes, 99.9.9 yeah. uh, .9 .9 are uh, people who are uh, welcoming people. Uh, they are enjoying this relation. And uh, I don't have uh, any case where an American man and woman who decided to go and walk on the souk and come back and says, well, I've been teased by X or Y. No, no. Uh, people uh, of Qatar uh, are, are, are very welcoming people and, and, and educated. Is there anything, I've got a couple of questions here which I'll get to, but is there anything the American White House, uh, and you can say President Trump or Jim Mattis, who works for President Trump, can do to make your life easier in terms of security here in Qatar? Well, uh, I think what we have uh, among each other with uh, the cooperation level and the uh, technical agreements and the uh, defense cooperation, uh, I think they are, uh, uh, they are at this stage, uh, they do the, 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 the job needed. But in the end of the day, Steve, I will emphasize mm -hmm. again, in Qatar, we work as if we are alone. We have friends, we have a lie, but we will never think that we will, you know, start with them to defend or to protect our country. We will start ourselves if there is any threat. And, and, and this is our philosophy, this is our doctrine. Let me ask you a question from Ruan Rujulat, um, who's with the Brookings Doha Center here in town. How can Qatar play a role in solving the crisis in Syria given the new developments there? Well, we encourage, uh, always in Syria, we encourage the, the, political, uh, the political solution. And whenever uh, anything needed from Qatar to facilitate or to uh, work with uh, in Syria to bring this uh, a crisis to an end, an ugly crisis, uh, Qatar will spare no effort uh, to, uh, to do so. And in the end of the day, in the end of the day, it will be a political solution. And uh, I think uh, the last meeting between the uh, f uh, you know four country in in Turkey, it's a it's a sign of hope, and we all support any uh, such sign to bring this peace and stability to Syria. We will be a supportive. We, never, the, we will never be. We will never be a, a, a barrier uh, for any, uh, you know, peaceful solution. If the Idlib solution. deal that we have right now uh, in holding off, essentially, an invasion of Idlib were to collapse, would that be something that would animate anger here? I think it is not easy to. Uh, it's not easy to maintain, but I I believe that the Turk are doing. Uh, 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 a magnificent uh, uh, effort to keep this, uh, to keep this, uh, you know, intact, and uh, they have uh, invested a lot to bring stability uh, to this place. And I'm sure, with the United States 
uh, involvement more and more in Syria to bring, uh, you know, uh, a peaceful solution with Russia, uh, good intention uh, to do so. I think uh, we will we will be there. Ahmed Al Mutawa asked an interesting question. He said that given Qatar's experiences in dealing with foreign fighters in the past, why not establish um, a committee or an organization on how to deal with this more formally in the future? I don't know if you already have one, but why not create an explicit body or practice or framing uh, to deal with foreign fighters um, or, or, or those, and to set a model, if you will. I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting about Qatar is that sometimes you do things here that do become viral, and so as you look at Iraq or you look at other countries where are going to have a much larger problem, what can be done here to educate and create best practices? Okay, I'm not trying to... This is my job to, uh, to market my country, but uh, I, will, I would like to tell you frankly what's happened in Qatar. I, uh, Ahmed's question is a very valid question, but one thing you should know in Qatar, Steve, that in every house in Qatar, there is something called a majlis. And this majlis are, with its own, our institution to rehabilitate or to pick people who just started to deviate from the track. Mm. Uh, this is one. So I think everybody in Qatar is taking care of everyone. This is one. In the social level. In so the, it's decentralized. It's a decentralized totally. And again, on the governmental level, if we say it, you know, on the centralized control, uh, uh, I think the easy access of the government entity are available. And they put a lot of effort, whether in law, in follow-up, in uh, reaching out to people who they think that they have intention or their intention is started to be they study the they study the uh, behavior and they study the individual so if they find out that there is an indication there is an individual change they will try to reach one and then they will start to see if there is uh, a behavior in a uh, you know, small society, or they will interfere immediately. They are very active in this, and you know, uh, I think it works. And today, uh, if you have uh, uh, statistics, you will find out that our, you know, uh, the education level in Qatar and people seeking education are are, uh, are tremendously remarked. Colin Clark of the Sufan Center. He's been one of our MCs here at the conference asks a great question on how you and Qatar view the great power competition between the U.S. and other powers. He's focused on China here. I'd even add Russia. When I was at Millipol, uh, one of the fun things, and I snapped a lot of pictures in case any of you are here, are of the Chinese groups that were going around and taking pictures of everything and Russian groups. Uh, so there's a quite big, you know, there's a lot of attention you know, coming in. But how do you look at their competition with the United States in terms of this region uh, from a Qatar national security perspective? Well, uh, we are a small country in a size, a very effective country of uh, But you, you hit above your weight. Well, you know, we've been trained very well for this. So uh, to reach, to be, uh, to keep uh, our uh, vision intact and our objective, we have to be friend with everyone. And I've been saying this uh, years and years, that Qatar does not belong to any block. Hmm. We, don't block to, we don't belong to block A or block B. We create a platform to these people who cannot uh, exchange their view because they don't want to be on one of these two blocks, that they can use our platform to exchange their thought and idea. But again, for the, the substance of your question, we do good relation with everyone. Uh, 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 so far, uh, they respect our sovereignty. And uh, we never uh, make enemies. Uh, this is, uh, again, uh, uh, you know, one of our uh, strategies here. So China is emerging. China mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, uh, is, is coming. Uh, uh, United States, uh, everybody knows the weight in the world economy and on Europe is another big block which is a big market to everyone. So we try to keep a good relation with everyone. Do you see China on the rise and US on decline? 
No, I see both of them are uh, on the rise. <laughs> no, maybe they will exchange one You're day. You're a great politician. Maybe, maybe they will exchange yeah. one day their financial eye on the moon. You know, they are yeah. both rising. Maybe they're, you see them exchanging there. It'll, it'll be a Qatari <laughs> rocket or a Qatari base. Um, our time is, is, is yes, really I limited. Like this. But I like this. We will start to build the base. You, you'll build now. the base up. It'll be a Qatari base. Yes, but yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, a few years ago, I was privileged to have a dinner with the Emir in New York with a small group of people. And there were two U.S. politicians I won't mention who saw Qatar as a base of uh, terrorism and, and had, had views and were completely unaware of um, the things that you had done that I know you personally had been in, involved in and I don't know if it's your portfolio now, but in saving hostages who had been taken by terrorist groups. We have Lawrence Wright here, uh, who's written about this beautifully in The New Yorker. And I just want folks to get a snapshot um, of your role out there in trying to solve some of these problems of, of not only Americans, but people from every complexion, national complexion, that have been taken by ISIS, Nusra, other terror groups, and the role you're playing. How much of a footprint of activity is that and concern for you in Qatar? Well, uh, first of all, uh, Steve, we share uh, the same human value uh, with, with you. Secondly, uh, we have a clear uh, direction from His Highness the Emir personally that if we can, all of us, I'm sure so many of my colleagues here are from NSA, intelligent, and other security agencies. They know this very clear. If we can save one life, we have to put every effort we can on this country to save this life if we can. And we take this instruction or direction very seriously here in Qatar. No matter what have been said, you know, no matter what our neighbors is trying to bash us or to, uh, so many people are, I think they are here with us today. Uh, they have participated, they have beloved one being uh, kidnapped or uh, they try to, uh, you know, uh, they try to uh, make us hear a voice of uh, a, a mother or a father who his uh, son or daughter has been kidnapped. They have been engaging with us and they know the steps we do. And they know that we do not engage terrorist group. We do not engage ISIS. We do not engage Al-Qaeda. But we find our way through mediators hmm. to try to do our utmost effort to save the people. And you have so many examples. You have the Nans and Ma'lula, uh, you have the, uh, the, uh, the Iranian, uh, the Iranian in, 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 C in, in Syria, you have uh, your uh, famous journalist, uh, uh, Theopatris. Theopatris. So many cases. And, and recently, uh, you know, our journalist colleagues from, from Japan, Every time we do such thing, we make sure that the people concerned are engaged so they know the steps are very clean and neat. I've been asked by Bobby Ghosh to ask you about your reactions to the Khashoggi murder and can Mohammed bin Salman continue, you believe, in the role he has given the arrows that look like what happened in Khashoggi. But I mentioned your reactions on the Khashoggi murder. murder. Well, first of all, we are all sorry about the, uh, the killing of Khashoggi. But to be honest with you, I'm not in a place here to elaborate or touch on this because I think there is an investigation ongoing. I think the Turks are uh, grabbing this investigation uh, in, a, in a good manner. And we all have just here to sit and pray that, uh, you know, they find uh, Khashoggi body mm -hmm. so he can have the respected and humble barrier by his family, wife, and children. Uh, and the, other than that, you know, I have nothing to say but to wait mm -hmm. and see the investigation come to an end. Was there as much shock here in this country and in your leadership in reading the news as there was in Washington? I think the shockwave uh, reached the whole uh, global on this case. You know, it's, uh, the, the way it has been presented, uh, you know, uh, it, it shocked everyone. Sajid Shapu asks, very interesting question, would Qatar play a role as a facilitator between the United States and Iran? 
if you could imagine a rapprochement or some effort down the way. I mean, we had, of course, the JCPOA, and now we don't have the JCPOA. Who knows what will happen? But uh, Donald Trump has actually said he'd be willing to meet the Supreme Leader or Rouhani, but would you see yourself, because you have good relations with both, both sides. Seeing the, uh, uh, seeing the uh, indication and seeing that the uh, American, whether the, the government of the people, they have uh, nothing against the, the people uh, you know, of Iran. I think it is possible. In my personal, in my personal view, uh, I think uh, America will, will come uh, to a point where they will have uh, a relation with Iran. When, how, you know, I don't know. But uh, seeing all the circumstances around, and I have said this before, I have mentioned this in, in Singapore, that uh, America is wiser than uh, going into uh, such war. And, you know, um, nobody, no matter how he thinks he is an ally or a strategic ally to the state, can drive the United States to go on a such war. Uh, because I think you have a wise leadership. It's an institutional established uh, long time. And they know their strategical interest very, very well. Just to wrap up, I, I want to praise you on your Twitter feed. I don't know if you actually do your Twitter feed. Do you know how to tweet? I do once every two or three months. So okay. if you tweet me, So I someone who reply. works for you is really good. Um, and I want to ask you a question that has nothing to do with the drama we've been talking about, but more of an internal question of what Qatar's challenges are. Sometimes we talk about what's great, sometimes we need to talk about what's not great. One of the things that impressed me that you did recently is you treated uh, three or four items of uh, Lolwa al Qatar's statements at Chatham House on various things, which I find, to one, they were incredibly important comments, but it was also a reflection of your support of the rise of women in important positions uh, in Qatar. And I think that used to be a blind spot in Qatar, and you've become an advocate uh, for women. You and I discussed this in Washington before. What do you think, as you look on that kind of issue, uh, uh, still needs to be done? And what is you, because you're deputy prime minister of this country, what do you think your country's not getting right yet that it needs to do? And we'll wrap up there, so make it good. Well, to be honest with you, uh, the speed change between, uh, and I'm being very uh, truly in this, the speed difference between us and our leadership is the most thing which worries me. They are driving in a 400 knots, and we are 150 knots behind them. Hmm. So their, uh, their goals and their objective are way, way ahead of us as a government or public servant, if you may call. But going back to Lulwa al-Khatar, I'll tell you something. Thank God that I left the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Otherwise, I will be fearing my chair now. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to my brother, Mohammed Rahman. No offense. Ladies and gentlemen, Minister of Defense, Deputy Prime Minister Khaled al Thank you so much.